I'd like to thank you all for joining the Financial Risk Management webinar today. This webinar is brought to you in partnership with Vermont Law and Graduate School and the Financial Futures Programs at CBOEO. Next slide, please. Just a bit of housekeeping. We're gonna keep the recording on throughout so that folks can watch this if they're unable to attend. We ask that you mute yourself when you're not speaking and uh, enter your questions into the chat, which Simeon and I will be monitoring. After the workshop, I'll make sure you get these slides as well as contact information for our program, as well as Nicole's program. So without further ado, I will pass it off to our microbusiness counselor, Simeon Geigel. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for attending today's class, which I'm really looking forward to. I just wanna give you a quick introduction to our program in case it's new to you and you'd like to take advantage of our services. Um, Microbusiness is a statewide program that works with low to moderate income Vermonters to help them start or expand a business. There's no fee for our services uh, for those that meet our eligibility requirements. Uh, and if you're interested in getting more details, learning if you qualify, um, feel free to connect with myself. Um, and it's a little hard to read on this slide, but you can see that there are three counselors um, in, at our program here. And uh, my my phone number is 860-1417, extension 116, um, and S. Geigel at CVOEO if you want to reach out to me personally. Uh, so uh, we... We help people in a variety of ways uh, start or expand their business, including helping people write business plans, answering general business questions for people, helping people think through their ideas, um, helping people access financing if that's a goal of theirs, and helping people do financial projections are just a few of the things that we help people with. Well, and this slide did not translate in the <laughs> formatting. I will no make problem. sure that it's clean on the version we send out to everybody. Oh, okay, thanks, Nicole. I appreciate it. So I mentioned that microbusiness is a, uh, a statewide program. There's five around the state and each microbusiness covers a, a certain territory consisting of um, uh, counties. And you can see the counties listed here. Um, CVOEO specifically covers Addison, Chittenden, Franklin, Grand Isle, uh, counties. So if you live in those counties, again, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you live in one of the other counties and want to connect with the micro business there, um, you've got uh, the agency and the contact person. And these slides will be provided um, to you uh, after the class as well. We also have our, oh, oh sorry. That's okay. Oh, oh, I went back. Okay, there we go. There we go. And we have our kind of overall uh, statewide website at the bottom there, mbdp.org, if you want to go on there to um, just identify uh, more specific information about the, the region that you're interested in connecting with the micro business around. Thanks, Nicole. Now, next slide. <laughs> next slide, please. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I always like to point out that there are other business support services in our region. I'm specifically focusing on the area that we cover, uh, but many of these are statewide as well. Uh, so uh, if you live in Burlington or are planning to start uh, a, uh, a business in Burlington, there is Burlington's Business and Workforce Development Department. They provide um, business counseling as well, but they also have a really great um, uh, loan options for people who are looking to start a business or expand one in Burlington. Uh, also, there's the Center for Women in Enterprise, Mercy Connections Women's Small Business Program, the Vermont Small Business Development Center, SBDC, uh, the Small Business Administration, SBA is a federal program, and finally, there's Champlain Valley SCORE in our area as well. Uh, and uh, be before we... Um, before I introduce Nicole more specifically, um, I just want to remember to uh, mention that we have another class coming up tomorrow. I've posted a link to our classes in the chat. Uh, we have a class specifically tomorrow on how to use AI for marketing. Uh, it's both an in-person and uh, uh, a, you can attend virtually as well. And so just go to our website if you're interested. It runs from 6 to 7.30 tomorrow. If you want to go in person, fine. Uh, you're welcome to. And it will be at the Doubletree Hotel um, in South Burlington. But you can also attend virtually. Great. Okay. Uh, the link to register, uh, Jessica, is um, in, the, in the chat. And feel free to unmute yourself if you've got a specific question about it. I'm happy to. I'm in the chat. Am I not? It, you, you joined after we put it in there here. 
Oh, okay. I was... Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate no it. No problem. Here we go. No problem. Great. Okay. So, uh, great. I would just like to kind of uh, present uh, our our uh, our the person who's presenting today, uh, uh, Nicole Kilo. Kilo Kaloran, excuse me, she's the professor of law. Thanks, uh, director with the Vermont uh, Small Business Law Center at the Vermont. Um, what does that acronym stand for again? Vermont Law and Graduate School. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we've been doing a series of classes with Nicole and her program, and um, they've all on different legal topics. They've all been great and wonderful and inc and incredibly informative. Uh, you can access our. Uh, recorded classes that we've done at our website as well. But uh, I just um, connected with Sophia and I guess they're doing a, a transition on our website. So it might not be possible to see it uh, immediately. Um, and if there's another uh, link people can go to Sophia, would you mind posting it in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. I'll throw our YouTube link in there in just a moment. That's great. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. No problem. Thank you for the introduction, Simeon uh, and Sophia. So you can see the agenda here. We're going to we're going to do contracts in one slide. It's going to be fun. Contracts 101. We're going to talk about debt, different kinds of debt, and how they interact with a business entity. We're going to touch on the process of collections. What's it like to collect an unsecured debt versus a secured debt? And I'll, I promise I'll define what the heck those things mean. Um, and then I'll talk about bankruptcy. Uh, and I added the word grace here because bankruptcy really is the process that people can seek out if they need some grace, if they need a fresh start. That's going to be a theme throughout this because uh, I personally want to shift the public perception of bankruptcy to to be able to see it as something that's a tool that's, that's there for them to use if they need help. Uh, and then probably... <laughs> probably the more important information for everybody here. I am going to go over common blind spots at the end on um, things that business owners don't necessarily anticipate that could cause some sort of financial risk for them. And then I'll talk a little bit about what you might do as a business owner to address those blind spots or to anticipate them. So with that said, I'm just going to jump right in. I have a brief glossary here. I'm not going to go over it one by one, but I've got some definitions of some of the words that we're using in this discussion in case it's uh, it's a challenge to understand what it, out of the context, some of the words that lawyers use are very confusing. It's like we speak a different language uh, and believe it or not, we do it intentionally. We call it legalese and we do it because there are so many large concepts in the law and we have conversations about these concepts and it just really works well for lawyers to boil the concept down to two words or one word, but it doesn't help people who don't speak the same language. So. That's why I put this in here to hopefully folks, if you don't understand a term and also ask in the chat too, or stop me if you need me to define anything. So contracts 101, <clears throat> this is a high level overview. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna get into too, too many details here because that's not what we're here to talk about, but I did wanna talk about contracts because that is essentially the foundation of the, the topic we're talking about here. Financial risk largely happens through contracting with a business. Financial risk can also come from errors and, and mistakes that might happen in the course of business or when people get hurt. A contract is just, uh, it, I put a summary here, it's an enforceable statement of a bargain. And there again, this is there's a lot that's packed into that because lawyers do that. Uh, something that's enforceable means that it can be enforced, obviously, that if someone breaks the agreement, then there's something that the person who is on the other side of it can do. It's a statement of a bargain because it's written down. It summarizes in reasonable detail the whatever the terms and conditions of the agreement between two people are. Um, it has to be usually in writing. For some transactions, it also has to be signed. It is possible to have a verbal agreement. It's possible to have an unsigned contract, but usually those are the requirements, reasonably detailed in writing and signed. It's pretty broad what one can do in the United States in terms of contracting. One can put almost anything into a contract that you can think of. The exceptions are if there's something against public policy uh, or for example, in a residential lease, there are certain base conditions that, that a landlord has to meet for a residential rental, heat, hot water, running water, and those things cannot be written into a contract. The, a residential landlord cannot put into a lease that they will not provide heat, or hot water or water. It's something that's required by law. So that's just an example. Um, there's four main components to a contract. There's the core deal. That's what the business owner is really good at. That's what lawyers are terrible at. We don't know what the transaction is, what the particular widget is, what the particular service being provided is. We're really good at the rest of it. Promises, protections, and procedures. 
that's the thing. That's what we do because we think as lawyers out to what might happen to our client. We anticipate disputes and conflicts and we try to direct our clients away from those disputes and conflicts by giving you good documents to start with. So promises, protections, and procedures. Promises are things like, I promise I hold title to this property and I can sell it to you. Protections are things like what happens if someone doesn't pay on their bill. And procedures are things like, where do I send notice? Where do I send a letter to, to make sure that the other party knows what's going on? Um, common pitfalls, high level view here again, not having a contract. These are things that lawyers don't want you to do. Not having a contract, not having a signature on your contract, taking a boilerplate and boilerplate is just a standard agreement with terms that don't really get negotiated. Accepting a boilerplate without asking questions or trying to negotiate something else in the agreement, that's, that's a common pitfall. Not having enough specifics in one's contract or just things happen. Life happens and changing circumstances are usually why people break contracts. You can see here too, there's a couple of common kinds of contracts that you probably have encountered. Leases are obvious. That's a commercial or residential space that someone is using. A waiver is something that uh, especially folks in the in the healthcare industry and healing arts use if there's going to be some sort of a risky activity that a, cl a client or a customer is going to engage in. A person will be warned of what the risk is of that activity, and then they're asked to sign a document that says, I'm not going to sue the person who's doing this for me because I understand there was a risk here. Uh, same with consent form. That applies to the, to the healing arts, too. Purchase and sale agreement is probably pretty straightforward. Operating agreement applies to limited liability companies. I um, always recommend that a, an, even a single member LLC have an operating agreement. Promissory note is just a document that you execute to uh, take out a loan. License is usually intellectual property. That's something that is either granted or taken out to be able to use someone else's intellectual property, something that's been copyrighted or trademarked or patented. Um, bylaws are the governing document for a corporation as opposed to an operating agreement for an LLC. And then an NDA, which you guys probably have seen everywhere in the world, uh, is a non-disclosure agreement. That's something that folks sign to say, this information will be kept private between us. So Common types of contracts, they all factor into debt because each of these kinds of contracts could create a debt, whether it's current or future. So I just wanted to go over that first. Uh, and now contract law, this is just a real high level about how things are interpreted. Contract law is a matter of state law. There are very few federal provisions that come into play for contracts. It's usually going to be in state court uh, interpreting state law. There are some things that are in case law that are in judge-made law that um, folks don't necessarily need to study too closely, but should be aware of. Uh, in the case law, it says, what is a bargain? What is the exchange that can go into a contract? What is an acceptance? Or what is something that says we're keeping this, this negotiation open? It's a counteroffer. And also case law dictates what kind of damages or relief someone can get. So for example, if you expected to get X, but you got Y, what was the difference between X and Y? That's expectation damages. Or you can see some other examples here. An injunction is something where you go to a court and you say, I'm being hurt and I need you to stop the person who's hurting me. An injunction is an order for that person to stop hurting you. Um, there is some statutory law that comes into play for contract interpretation. Again, I'm not expecting you guys to do a deep dive on this, but just so you know, Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC, that covers the sale of goods and there are specific rules that apply to transactions for sale of goods. Article nine is what comes into play when someone has taken out a loan and they've given a security interest or a collateral interest to the to the lender. And then the lender, if the if the debt goes bad, the lender can come and take whatever was, was uh, given as collateral. If some of those words are confusing or the process is confusing, I am gonna go over it in a little more detail in a few slides. Everything else about contracts, if it's not state law or if it's not case law, if it's not statutory law, it's really a matter of reading an agreement, reading a contract. So this is why I tell everybody who comes to me with a commercial lease that unfortunately the commercial lease is the law. The four corners of that document is what di dictates what the parties can do, what rights they have, what recovery they can make, et cetera. So I'm gonna pause now after contracts. I see there's something in the chat. Oh, feel free, feel free to post your questions in the chat. Okay, uh, any questions for right now or should I move on? Hearing zero. I have a question. Ah, go ahead, Adam Miller. Yeah, is um, you said that uh, case law can apply. Is that state case law, or is that case law? Can case law from other other jurisdictions be be applied to things under fall under Vermont state law? Yeah, generally, generally it's going to be Vermont. 
Okay. Um, contract law really is a matter of each state's law. And so there's going to be a body of case law for contracts, how they're interpreted, et cetera. It is, and I say this um, just because it's, if, if you're looking for any sort of other case law, if you look within the second, the second district, which is New York, Vermont, and um, Connecticut, I believe, those three states, how those states interpret contract law can sometimes influence the others because they're in the same federal district. But okay. yeah, generally it's going to be Vermont law. That was a lawyer question. <laughs> Any other you, questions until you are you are a lawyer? That's why I was asking. <laughs> well, no, I mean like that's a question a lawyer would ask. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Okay, moving on. Here we go. Um. So, what the heck is debt? You guys know what debt is, but I just wanted to go over a couple of different kinds of debt. There's the kind of debt that's really immediate, that's owed immediately. So, a purchase, sale of goods, usually the the payment is due immediately. A line of credit that's there's a slight delay but the money is owed as soon as the credit is is taken out overdraft fees that's another thing one you know one you you go over in your account and the automatic consequences you pay 15 bucks there's also ongoing debt or sort of deferred debt that's what i'm thinking of when i'm thinking about long-term performance contracts or leases that's what i'm thinking about there is an obligation to pay going at, that's ongoing every month for example or that's associated with a set of services or goods and the debt is not something that is just a one transaction and then it's over. So usually those agreements, long-term performance contracts or leases have a lot of conditions put into them to make sure that through the course of the five years or whatever it is that's the length of the contract, that both the parties know what happens, when it happens, what the procedure is, et cetera. Uh, a license, an intellectual property license is also sort of an ongoing one. It is essentially a document that says either you, person B, have the right to use my person A intellectual property, my copyright or trademark rights, for example, or it's the reverse. And it is usually a uh, an ongoing document of you will use, you'll, you can use my intellectual property rights every time you do, there will be a royalty paid, how it's calculated, how long it goes, et cetera. So that's another example. Future and conditional debt. This is something that doesn't necessarily tie in for a lot of businesses, but it is something you should know about. This is what I'm talking about when there's somebody investing in a business or if somebody comes in and puts a share into an LLC, or uh, you can see here liens and mortgages and UCC1 statements. A lien or a mortgage is simply a, a piece of paper that a lender puts on your home or on a piece of valuable equipment uh, that says that if the debt is not paid, then the lender gets to take that piece of equipment or the home. That's a lien or a mortgage. Also wanted to point out to future conditional debt might include an equity cash out from a partner who's departing a business. That's why I always recommend people have an operating agreement because they may be able to put a procedure in place for that process. And then I, I include in the fourth category here, errors and omissions, because there's stuff that cannot be anti uh, anticipated perhaps, but that will lead to a debt for an individual or a business. Talking about an injury, somebody who gets hurt and they sue the business, claiming that the business is, is responsible, uh, or even just breaking a contract because circumstances change, for example. If there's some sort of a money judgment that comes against a business or an individual uh, for errors and omissions, that's usually what it looks like is a piece of paper from the court. So that's the basic kinds of debt. What do business entities have to do with all this? Um, sole proprietors are unfortunately unprotected from the, the debts of the business because the sole proprietor is the same thing as the business. There's no separation. The, the uh, owner's assets are the business assets. Creditors can go to the owner's assets to pay the business's debts. Um, same with unofficial partnerships, partnerships that have not been incorporated or filed with the Secretary of State. If it's more than two, if it's more than one person doing business, but they haven't registered with the Secretary of State, they essentially are the same. The, the personal assets of the, of the owners are the same as the business assets. They can go to both for creditors. Um, LLCs, partnerships, limited partnerships, corporations, when someone incorporates with the state, there is a limited liability protection shield that pops up. And that shields the owner from the business's debts. And that, in, that can include a lot of these kinds of debts. And it can include an immediate debt or an ongoing debt, or even a debt from an error or an omission or an injury that happens to someone. In general, I'll, I'll say that anybody who is a member or an owner of an incorporated business entity in the United States is generally assumed to be making business transactions and, and, and taking out debts on behalf of the business that are in the, the business's best interest. But if the owner is not taking out debts, 
or is not taking out loans or, or uh, incurring financial risks for the business that are not in the business's best interest, there might be some, some disconnect there. Um, when does an LLC or corporation not protect the owner? A couple of different circumstances. It's very, very important for anybody who sets up a business entity to completely separate themselves from the business entity because they are officially now two separate entities. And if one, if the business owner wants to protect their own personal assets and they have an incorporated entity, they need to file paperwork. They need to have a separate bank account. They need to take all the steps necessary to make it clear that the owner is one entity, one person, and the business is another person. So the things that I mentioned there, are how people do it, separate bank account for the business and the owner, no transactions going into either account that are for either for the for the uh, the wrong person. Um, another way to do it is to have uh, things that I think of as legal fictions, but they're effective. To have, for example, somebody is working out of their home, they might have a piece of paper that, or maybe they're running their business out of their home. They might have a piece of paper that says that the owner who owns the home is leasing space to the business for the purposes of whatever that business is doing. Maybe there's a nominal payment coming back 10 bucks a month or something like that. That piece of paper establishes a formal relationship that separates out the owner and the, and the business and shows they're two separate people and that they're transacting together, even though it's the same person. It's really weird. It's a legal fiction, but it does work. So there's different ways that the owner can take, can take steps to separate themselves from the business. Owners can also um, take, they can become personally responsible for debt if they hurt someone. An example that my colleague always gives is that even if, even if the owner is driving the company car on company time on company business, when they run into the school bus and they hurt the kids in the school bus, they're personally responsible for it. That's an extreme example, but that is just, just a way to illustrate that if someone messes up, if they make a mistake, if they make an error and they hurt someone, they may be personally responsible for it, even if they have an incorporated entity, an LLC or corporation. Adam, go ahead. Hey, how does how does um, leasing personal assets to your business, like if I'm going from a sole proprietorship into an LLC, I have all my own, I already have all the assets, the capital assets I need to run my business. Can I just have a lease like that to my business? But then my question is then, I buy new assets, how can I get how can how can I make those deductible if, if you know you know how what's that transition like or you know how's that interact right I can't speak to the deductibility that's something you really need to talk to an accountant about but I know that um you know somebody's going from sole proprietor to incorporating if the sole proprietor already has valuable equipment that is usually an opportunity once the once the business is incorporated for the um the owner to just lease that equipment to the business to make sure to make clear that they're two separate entities Mm -hmm. uh, and to, if, especially if there's going to be debt associated with the business to take those assets out of that world so that that debt can't be collected against the assets that make the business run. Mm -hmm. So how does it, how does it work when one has already launched and then brings in additional assets or equipment or tools or something like that? Is that your question, Adam? Yeah. Cause you know, I mean, if, if, I, if I'm like a sole member, uh, LLC or something, if, you know, it's a pass through entity. For tax purposes, so it, it, for me, it's un, it's unclear if I if I can buy if I can buy buy uh, you know buy new equipment and consider it a personal asset, but still make it deductible. You know, for, for you know, a deductible expense. Yeah, no. You know, that's that's you know, it's a. I'm sure there's an answer somewhere, or it's just there probably is. Yeah, and okay. I don't know the answer to it. I'm sorry. Tax is the one area where we just fully dodge because accountants are cheaper than we are and accountants are probably going to have a much better idea. Yeah. So your instinct is probably right that generally a business is not going to be able to claim deductions or depreciation of equipment that's not in the business's name. I don't know for sure. That's a good question to ask. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know the answer actually. Okay. Um, so personal responsibility for hurting someone that can be a debt that goes to the, uh, the individual owner and not the business. And then, this is a really big one and it's a big blind spot. Personal guarantee. If someone files an LLC and they go to the bank and they take out a loan and the bank says, sure, we'll give you a loan, but you have to sign a personal guarantee. The debt's in the LLC's name, but the owner has signed as a personal guarantor. That means that the, the business's assets 
and the owner's assets are going to be available to that creditor. Did you have a question, Simeon? Yeah, just a, a quick one, just kind of going back to some of the things that people do to separate themselves from, from their business. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it, you know, for example, can you talk about how somebody would want to, the, the business represented in a lease versus themselves? Uh, also, I've also heard like there are there is a specific way that people should sign correspondence if they're um, an LLC. And I'm wondering mm. if you can maybe speak to those a little bit. And if there's anything other other like smaller practical things like that that you've run up against in your experience that you could mention. Okay, so the first one, the second one was a particular way of signing as an LLC and remind, go back to the first one again for me. Uh oh, if they're entering a lease, how they would. Entering a lease. Yeah. Okay, so lease and a signature. Uh, a lease technically should be, a commercial lease technically should be between the business that's renting the space that's going to operate out of the space and the landlord. Landlords usually want a personal guarantee. And so leases themselves, if it's not with the same person, if it's not the business owner leasing to themselves as, as a separate entity, then those, I would highly recommend that, that folks try to not sign a personal guarantee for any sort of a, a commercial lease. That can be very tricky, but um, that's one thing. I'm, I'm going to come back to that because I don't know if I actually answered the question, Simeon, maybe we're thinking about a different lease. The signature, th go ahead, I'm, clarify for me. No, no, I think you, I think you covered it. I was just, uh, I think some people that might be an LLC would, would automatically just think that the lease would be between themselves and the landlord and not their business. Ah, yes. And here's what you're looking for. If you want to make sure it's just between the business, this, oh, this ties into the signature question. I see when someone is signing on behalf of themselves, um, typically the signature line is just going to say the name of the person below the signature line along with the date. When someone is signing on behalf of a business entity or a separate entity, then the signature line essentially puts at the top, this is the entity. So say the small business law center is the entity. And then below that there's a signature. And below that it says by, that would be the person's name signing it. And below that there's a line that says it's, it's colon, I-T-S colon. That is where the position of the person who is signing the document goes. This is a formality that separates, that, that distinguishes between, okay, here's an individual signing a document personally, or here's an individual signing a document on behalf of a corporation. That makes it clear that there's, that it's not a personal guarantee, that it's, that it's actually somebody signing on behalf of the business. All of that said, um, before someone signs any sort of an agreement on behalf of a business entity, they have to make sure that they either have the authority to do that, and that's either going to be that it's in the operating agreement or it's just something they can do as a single member owner of an LLC or for a corporation. It might be necessary to have a corporate resolution that says that such and such officer can act on the corporation's behalf in this particular action. But there is a distinction between individual promise and a promise on behalf of a business. Now, when it comes back to a lease, um, I would warn everybody to look for that in any, in any sort of a lease look for language that promises that the owner is going to be responsible for the debt. If, if the lease fails, if there's an, if things change, if folks need to move out, if there's a disaster, um, any requirement for someone to sign personally and not as an officer or a member of their business, that should be, that should be a big pause. I hope that answers the question, Simeon. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Collections. I don't enjoy collections, but it also is also the stuff that I did in practice. So it's something that I am unfortunately comfortable with and familiar with. Um, collections without a lawsuit can be, well, the collections without a lawsuit is probably what you imagine it is. It's phone calls, it's letters, it's demands for payment. Um, sometimes if you have a debt and you want to pay it, you can pay it voluntarily. If you don't pay it, folks who Think you're owed, th who think they're owed the debt have a couple of different options. They can either do pre-suit pre collections or they can they can file a lawsuit. Um, there's also the option of reporting to one's credit bureaus to try to collect a debt. That's just a trigger that some folks use to try to get it on someone's radar. Um, so that's collections before a lawsuit. There is sometimes, I warn folks that if they have 
uh, line of credit or if they have an agreement or some some sort of a contract with a larger business, a larger service provider, usually that contract requires that if there's a conflict that instead of going to court, um, folks would either try negotiation or mediation or more likely they would have to go through arbitration. So uh, basically any credit card, any um, most bank agreements, most loan agreements, really most contracts these days, if they are put together by an entity that's not a small entity, if it's if it's a bank, if it's a big corporation, it's probably gonna have an arbitration requirement in there. Arbitration is simply an out of court process that resolves a dispute. It looks very much like a court procedure uh, or like a court process. There might be a arbitrator who's sitting in a position like a judge who's making decisions about facts and, and who wins. Um, there might be a panel of arbitrators. The There might be evidence, there might be argument. Uh, there might be hearing or hearings for arbitration. The end result for an arbitration is a piece of paper that the person who wins can take to the state where you live, if you're the debtor, if you owe the money, um, they can take a piece of paper to the state, domesticate it, and start to collect on that debt. Besides that, though, the other way of collecting a debt, if phone calls don't work, if letters don't work, if voluntary payments are not coming, if um, credit reporting is not having an effect, is to file a lawsuit. There's two options in Vermont. There's the small claims court, which is for cases that are up to $5,000 damages, cheap filing fees, simple process, relaxed rules of evidence. It's supposed to be DIY friendly and it is, um, but it does have that cap on damages. If you are owed more than $5,000, inclusive of costs and attorney's fees and everything like that, then small claims court, uh, you're, you're capped at that 5,000, you can't get anything more. Superior court, there's no cap, there's no end to the damages that can be obtained. There's also the ability to go into superior court and do things like file for an injunction and say, someone's hurting me. Can you stop them? It can be complex uh, in superior court. Usually there's more formal processes. The rules of evidence are in play. Uh, the rules of civil procedure are in play. And it really is a setting where it's not super DIY friendly. It's possible to represent yourself in superior court. It's entirely possible. People do it all the time successfully. It's very, very stressful. Uh, and it's very confusing for most folks and it can be slow and costly. Um, but that is the option for folks who are owed debts for more, that are more than $5,000. When it comes to collecting judgments, there's a couple of different things that you can do. Uh, if you hold at the, at the other end of a court case, I should say, if a creditor wins in a court case for collections, then they get a piece of paper that says they're owed money. That's a money judgment. The judgment is something that can be enforced through the court. And, and it can look like either garnishing someone's wages uh, or garnishing their bank account. It's possible to record the judgment as a lien on someone's property. So if they sell it, then the, the judgment creditor gets paid. It's also possible to do in Vermont what I call a till tap. This is where the court issues an order, authorizes the sheriff to walk into the business's uh, brick and mortar and open up the till and take whatever's in it to pay the debt. So. These are all options of collecting judgments. They're not something that anybody wants to necessarily face in their business, but those are the options. Any questions on unsecured collections? Okay. Secured collections are a little more formal. There's a, this is where UCC Article 9, Uniform Commercial Code Article 9 kicks in. There's particular procedures that have to be put in place because secured debt if you remember, the secured debt is the, is the one where somebody had to put up a piece of equipment or a piece of property to be able to get the money. That piece of, a piece of equipment or property is the collateral. And where there's collateral that has to be collected to pay a debt, there's, that's why there's special rules in place. We can't just take folks home and say, oh, I get it now and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply it to this debt. There's a process. Um, and the mechanism for securing the debt is usually either a lien on a piece of property which is filed with the, with the land records or a mortgage on a piece of property that's filed with the land records or for equipment uh, and personal property, there's a separate filing process with the Secretary of State. Uh, UCC-1 is the, is the name of the filing. UCC-1 lien is, is put on equipment that's offered up as collateral in, in lending. Um, more challenging to collect secured debt. It's, as I said, strict procedural requirements, definitely a lot of steps that have to be taken and it takes a long time too. The options are essentially repossession if uh, that be that the collateral was personal property or assets, and if it was a piece of real property, residential commercial property, it would be a foreclosure process. 
Um, and the process itself for collections for secured debt is really much the same. The property has to be secured and that's either gonna be through a rate of repossession, uh, or, or sorry, for a vehicle, usually for a vehicle loan, um, the person who lent the money to purchase a vehicle usually writes into their agreement that they can just go in and take the vehicle if there's no, if the if the debt has gone bad. So just be aware that if you have a vehicle loan and you go and you don't make payments, they can just come and take the car. Um, for homes, that's different. There is a process to be able to obtain possession of a, of a home or of other equipment. For homes, uh, there is a year long process, at least, well, usually takes about a year with a six month waiting period for any mortgage lender to be able to go in and take possession of a property that it's foreclosing on. Once the property is secured, Typically, it's sold at auction for fair market value. Whatever is obtained at fair market or whatever is obtained at auction is applied to the debt that's owing. And then whatever is left owing of the debt is collected in the traditional way that I, that I put in the other slide uh, against the person who owes it. So lawsuit, phone calls, letters, credit report, et cetera. So that's secured collections, a little more complicated process. I'm going to pause there too, because we'll talk about bankruptcy and grace next. Any questions about collections, guys? Bankruptcy. Um, I like this topic <laughs> because I think it's because I think bankruptcy is is humanitarian. It's intended to provide relief to people when they need it. The um, the twin pillars of bankruptcy you can see here really are to make sure that that creditors get paid equitably out of the assets of the uh, the person who's filing bankruptcy, and it also isn't. It's there to create a pause to give the debtor an, the ability to breathe. There's a pause on collections actions when one files bankruptcy. The purpose is to give people the ability to start over and to get the creditors to go away. Debt and bankruptcy is sorted out by priority. So we just talked about secured and unsecured debt that comes into bankruptcy. Secured debt gets priority, things that have a piece of property that are attached to the other end of it, home mortgage, auto lien, tax lien, equipment lien. Unsecured priority debt is the debt that's really not going to come out of bankruptcy that cannot be discharged that's going to continue after bankruptcy stuff like spousal support and maintenance child support payments employee wages and benefits tax obligations sometimes also student loan payments student loans cannot be discharged but there are certain kinds of debts that when someone files bankruptcy whatever's not going to a secured creditor is going to go first to an unsecured priority creditor and everybody else, medical debt, credit cards, personal loans, everything else goes under unsecured, non-priority debt, and they get the leavings for whatever's left over. Assets that are not exempt are put into trust and usually seen or overseen by a trustee that's hired by the court, uh, or assets are sold to pay creditors depending on what chapter of bankruptcy a person files. I'm gonna go over the chapters in just a second. Um, but I just wanted to make clear that when I say assets that are not exempt, what I'm talking about is, uh, for example, as someone who files bankruptcy individually, if they have if they have a home that's worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars and they owe two hundred thousand dollars on the home, they have fifty thousand dollars in equity on the home. They do not have to give over that fifty thousand equity to the bankruptcy court. They don't have to give that over to their creditors because under Vermont law. They can claim up to $125,000 in equity in their home that's protected. That 125 equity is exempt from creditors, just as an ex explanation. There's also exemptions for things like equipments of, or equipment for the trade, trade uh, tools of the trade, um, farm stuff, feed for animals, equipment for animals. There's certain categories that are exempted from bankruptcy. Different options for filing bankruptcy. Um, just want to clarify, because this is often a question, typically, and this comes into the personal guarantee question too, Simeon, if a business is filing bankruptcy, and if the owner has personally guaranteed the business's debts, most likely the owner's bankruptcy is going to follow, because those debts will flow over onto them, and they'll probably have to. They'll probably have to deal with them too. Um, so just wanted to address that up front, because it's a very common question. There are several different kinds of bankruptcy that are available to business owners. Uh, the first one is what everybody thinks of when they think of bankruptcy. It's sell everything, pay what you can, and walk away. That's what we call liquidation. Um, everything that is not exempt is gathered into the bankruptcy estate. Any assets, any money, any property that's valuable that's gathered into the bankruptcy estate. What can be sold is sold. What, what money is left over after the sale 
is paid to the creditors and the creditors get to eat the rest. That's chapter seven. Uh, chapter 13 is more of like a catch up payment plan. It can be three to five years. It's negotiated with the creditors. Sometimes uh, the, the debtor will not have to pay the full amount of debt that is owed. Sometimes it'll be a compromised amount. They make payments directly to the trustee. The trustee pays the creditors for three to five years of the plan. And then at the end of the three to five years, the, the uh, debtor is caught up. They're current on their debts. They get to walk away with a clean slate. Chapter 13 is not available to corporations. It is available to single member, single member pass-through LLCs. Chapter 11 is something that's very hard for businesses to do. And it's very, it's very rare for a business to get through chapter 11. It's re- re- reorganization at the agreement of the creditors. The business can look at its finances, restructure, possibly take out different loans, reorganize its debts, et cetera. So that at the end of the three to five years, they are, they're caught up. It is, it is similar to a chapter 13, but it's available to corporations as well. So chapter 11 reorganization, very complex, very difficult for businesses to get through. and doesn't happen a lot. Um, for any family farms though, there is a simplified process that's similar to chapter 13 that they can go through that allows them to retain the farm assets, reorganize the farm debt because it's a special, it's a special beast, the different, the different kinds of farm debt and how they do that. Um, that's available for family owned farm businesses only, but that is, that's another chapter you can choose in bankruptcy. So that's bankruptcy in two slides. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You're all stunned. Bankruptcy is so interesting, isn't it? I just love it. Nicole, I guess I just have a a quick question. Um, how would somebody decide which one of these they they are going to fall into? Would that be getting legal help to do that, or? Yeah, if someone is looking at bankruptcy, um, I want to say this too: if if someone's looking at bankruptcy, you really do want to talk to an attorney. Uh, and the attorney, it is possible to do bankruptcy on your own. It's really it's really quite difficult. It's challenging. So first thing to do is talk to a lawyer to look at the debts that one has, look at one's assets and determine if there might be an opportunity to do chapter 13. It's also based on the goals of the person. Do they want to try to repay their debts or do they just want to walk away and get and be done with it? So talk to an attorney. Typically what the attorney will do is depending on the circumstances of the person, if they're not paying their debts already, the attorney will say, well, then save the money so you can pay for bankruptcy. They put the money aside that they're not paying to their creditors and then they have the money to do a bankruptcy process. Lawyers typically charge a flat fee for a simple chapter seven or chapter 13. So it'll be like 1500 or 2000 down and that covers most of the process. Um, But really it's just, it's an individual decision about do I have so much debt that I can't deal with it and I just have to sell it and walk away. Do I really wanna keep my creditors happy? It depends on the creditor, depends on the nature of the debt. Um, Or do I wanna try to reorganize and get them to agree to it and see if I can take out new loans and get it to work? That it's really based on the goals of the business. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other bankruptcy questions? I guess it's lawyers who get interested in bankruptcy and maybe not everybody else. Oh, well. Okay. So common blind spots. Actually, actually, there's more of these. I could have two screens on this. These are things that I think you should watch out for in terms of financial risks. After I've explained all of this, this is probably the, this is probably the most important slide. Avoid signing personal guarantees. Sign for the business using that little trick, you know, here's the name of the business, here's the signature line by Nicole Kaloran, it's CEO or CFO or something like that. Avoid signing personal guarantees uh, if, if you have an incorporated entity, if you have a business entity. Read your darn contracts, please. It is really important to read them. If you don't read what's in a contract, you're still held responsible for what's in the contract. It doesn't matter if you've read it or not. So you need to know what is in that agreement. Simply having a contract is a pitfall. (laughs) Some folks don't have a contract. It's entirely possible to transact and do business without having a written agreement, but especially for uh, businesses that have a potential degree of risk or somebody who has a complex, complex transaction that really should be put into writing or the three things that require one to have an agreement in writing and signed are transactions for sale of land, sale of goods for more than $500 or an agreement that's gonna take more than a year to complete. Those things have to be inciting in writing and in signed. Next mistake is having not having lawyers recontract. Um, 
if you're looking at a contract, if you're considering using one, or if you're considering signing one, not having a lawyer take a look at it and give you advice about what's in it, what it means, that can be a pitfall, a blind spot. And um, my program can provide a free referral to an attorney. So if you're worried about the cost, come talk to me. You can also sort of, go you can Google lawyers if you're looking for one. You can see who the business owner down the street is using or a friend is using. There's the VBA lawyer referral service. Um, but I'll provide the information for our program too. If you want, we can help you find a lawyer. It's risky to be a sole proprietor in a line of business that has some risk involved with it. It's it's possible that some folks are not doing anything risky and maybe they're just providing uh, consulting seems to be the easy one. If folks are just consulting, as long as there's not a degree of legal or financial risk associated with it, then it's not a super risky line of business. Regardless, if there's any risk of, of uh, a debt coming at, a, at, a, at an owner or the owner's assets, I always suggest that someone incorporate. An LLC is a simple flexible entity. That's why people use it the most. Corporation is more rigid, has more rules, but that there's the LLC protection, corporation corporation protection, that the, L, the uh, limit liability shield is what I recommend you, you seek. An operating agreement as an LLC, uh, I think is critical. Even if you're a single member LLC, I think everybody should have one. That's personal opinion. Uh, and I'm pretty biased, but it's because the base requirements for the operations of a limited liability company don't really provide a lot of protections that many folks want. The example I gave the uh, earlier was, say somebody comes into the business and puts equity into it, puts $20,000 or something into it. By default, when the business dissolves or when that person departs from the business, which they can do if they want to, um, unless there's an operating agreement put in place saying when they can leave the business, they can simply leave. They may be able to say, okay, I'm taking my equity with me. But if the operating agreement is in place saying that this is the process and there will be an offer of first refusal and there will be a buyout, et cetera, that can protect the remaining members of the business from the consequences of that person leaving. And that's just one example though. Please have an operating agreement if you're an LLC. Uh, and please put good thought into it. It's almost more important that people think about what they want their business to look like, what they want operations to look like, than it is to have specific wording in the agreement itself. Uh, don't ignore debts. It's really easy to, especially if there's just collector's calls coming in or letters, throw away the letter and ignore the call. Do pay debts. Um, do negotiate with creditors. It's very common for folks to feel that anxiety of, shoot, I'm behind on a payment or I can't afford this or my, you know, I'm not getting the cash flow that I need and I'm just going to ignore it. Don't ignore creditors. They have a lot of power if you ignore them. Get things in writing too. And this is speaking from the position of a, of a collector. If you don't get things in writing, if you don't get, you will pay this in exchange for relief of this debt, or we're going to discharge this debt or whatever it might be. If you, do, if you don't get those things in writing, it can come back and bite you. Two more to consider, and then there's a couple I'd throw on here too. Reporting to credit bureaus. If you are somebody who has a debt that is owed to you, it doesn't matter if you filed a lawsuit or have a judgment. You can file, you can, you can report to the credit bureaus that there is a debt owed to you. There's three credit bureau agencies. You can you can report to one or all three. It's a really great way to get someone's attention. Um, speaking from collections, if you put something on their credit bureau, they usually pay attention. Uh, next one on this list here, considering bankruptcy is an option. It is a safety net. It's there for a reason. Uh, I encourage folks to think about it if, if they're in financial uh, if they're in financial difficulty. Some other things to think about here too: pitfalls and blind spots, data privacy especially for, and I can go on and add these to another slide if you want, guys. Um, data privacy is a real big one. Folks who are selling online, folks who have any sort of an online presence or who exchange any sort of money online, if they take any sort of customer information, even if it's just name and address, um, data privacy is a potential concern. If there is a breach and that data is obtained, there's an automatic set of requirements that are very, very difficult to meet that come into play. For, and it doesn't matter if you're a sole proprietor or a big multinational corporation, you still have the same requirements for if there's a data breach. Mm -hmm. So data privacy can be very expensive. Definitely pay attention to that. Simeon. Yeah, on, on, on that topic, um, if someone is just accepting credit cards through um, like a credit card processor like PayPal or Square, <laughs> would, would that, do they need to do that? Do they need to have a data a data data privacy policy? 
Yeah. It's... If they are simply using third party vendors, they need to be familiar with the data privacy policy of the third party vendor. So PayPal definitely look into their policy, look at what the what they're how they're treating the data. Um, if someone is not taking personally identifiable information, that's that's the phrase, that's the legalese PII, personally identifiable information. If you're not collecting that from customers and keeping that information, then there's not there, then there's no data privacy concern. But if that information is being collected, even names and retained somewhere, then there's a need to to have a policy in place that says what's going to happen with it. And if there's a breach, it's pretty, it's it's very difficult to deal with. Would that apply to if they're emailing clients and just having email exchanges? Um, no. If one has a website or if one keeps a customer list, mm -hmm. for example, and it's keep and it's kept online, okay. that might be an option. That might be an wow. example there. Um, if someone has a mailing list and they maintain and they maintain that electronically, it doesn't have to be a big collection of information and credit cards. It can just be a collection of names. But if it's kept electronically and if other people might access it on your computer, that's private data. Thank you. So, yeah, we have a webinar on this. If anybody's interested, you can Google Vermont Small Business Development Center CNPP webinars. That's Community Navigator Pilot Program, CNPP. Uh, the CNPP webinars, we did a data privacy webinar with um, Professor Jeanette Ikes and one of the SBDC business advisors. So that's, feel free to go look at that. That's a free recording if you want to go visit that. Um, the last thing I want to put on everybody's radars in terms of blind spots is just regulatory compliance and permitting. There is an enormous set of um, requirements that apply to every individual and business in the country and in the state of Vermont. Everything from clean air to clean water to um, to land use to whether you're going to have a big commercial operation on a piece of property for Act 250, et cetera. There's a lot of different regulatory requirements that might kick in for any given business. This is where lawyers can be very helpful to try to spot what those requirements are going to be, what the compliance is going to be. That can be a a big blind spot for folks. Um, even for example, somebody who's making a product uh, out of a, out of their own home, and in the process of making that product, they put they have to put some sort of a a, a chemical, or they put some sort of a vaporized uh, material into the air, or something like that. That could potentially be at a high enough level that could require a Clean Air Act permit, even in one zone. So. It's really good to be aware of what the regulatory requirements are, what the different schemes that are controlling different people's activity are, um, and then to make sure that that you're paying attention to that, getting the right permits, uh, and anticipating that that might be a cost if you don't have the right permit. Land use is a common one. Zoning, town zoning permits. Um, tip there is just to talk to your zoning administrator for your town and see what permits might be necessary, because you don't want to just operate and then try to get the permits later. It's a nightmare. That was a really big brain dump. And a couple of those items are not on this slide, but I just want to open it up and see if there's any questions because that's that's the end of our presentation. Um, if there's no other questions, I can just, let me just go over this really quickly and then I'll, I'll pause again and we'll answer questions if we have them. If uh, Folks are interested, we have a website that should be up in the next few weeks. It will be at sblc at vermontlaw.edu. You can also see our email address there. If you want help with a legal matter, if you want to do uh, an educational consult with our team, or if you want to work with an attorney, uh, this is where you submit an inquiry, tinyurl.com slash sblc inquiry, and that will go straight to us. We'll get you going. You can say on there if you have a, a quick legal need that's going to take a half hour phone call, or if you're working on developing something, we can talk in a few weeks, or if you need to work with an attorney, we can get you straight to working with one now. So that's what we, that's the services that we provide. Um, I'm just gonna come back to it. Any other questions? And well, Nicole, I'll just say, um, and what you're able to provide, is that specific to businesses versus personal? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just did not, lay, I did not lay that out very well, did I? <laughs> um, we do actually support folks' personal legal legal needs sometimes, but that's because, as it turns out, business own, businesses are owned by people. Uh, but yeah, this service is available for small businesses in the state of Vermont. We don't. Um, we can provide it to virtually any small business as long as they have less than I think ten employees, and as long as you're not looking for someone to represent you in court, 
I cannot, the program cannot pay for, uh, cannot pay for an attorney to represent a business in court and in a legal proceeding. Everything else we can cover for, for any small business in the state. I just like to put in a plug for your uh, program, Nicole. I know I've sent lots of folks that I work with uh, around business to you and um, your program has been really, really helpful. Um, they've, um, some of the, the needs that clients have gone to your program for and have been connected with lawyers around has been for help with uh, registering their business, reviewing contracts, answering questions, um, so it's really been an incredibly useful program that was really missing within kind of our business landscape um, over the last many, many years. So it's really a, a great service. And I would encourage anybody on this um, class to take advantage of that. That's my two cents. You, Welcome. I appreciate that. Adam, you have a question. Yeah. So um, 10 hours of, of consult time. How is, is that, is that for like up to 10 hours on one thing or how, how's that, or if I have multiple questions and multiple times, is that, uh, what, what's, what, how's that apportioned or what, what are the sort of particulars around that as I evaluate another, this another good potential question. source for legal advice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another question that a lawyer would have asked. So, um, good question, Adam. The, there is, uh, there's the limitation on services for representation in court. I can't pay for that. Um, it sure. is, per business. So I'm offering 10 hours for each business. So for example, if someone has an LLC and they're going to, or if they're a sole proprietor and they run one line and they want to open an LLC for another line or to hold property or something like that, that I can, I can call that a separate business and I can offer another 10 hours, but it is generally 10 per business. Um, and it really does, it can cover a lot of different things that are just short of that bar that I have. So advice, they can help. If someone's in a, in a, dispute or a conflict, I can usually help them to work with an attorney to try to negotiate with the other side, try to work out some sort of an agreement, even up to preparing to file a lawsuit. Um, it's really pretty broad. Okay. But say if, say if, um, you know, if I have a plan for getting, for doing some incorporation and then I also have a contract to, 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 to review mm -hmm. and negotiate with, with a client, it's is that all included 10 hours. in the 10 hours? Yeah, that's all included in the 10 hours. Sorry, I wasn't yeah, clear about it's, that. Okay, it's not like it's not like one, it's not like one function up to 10 hours. It's 10 hours. No. Totally. Um because contract okay. review is going to take like 2 hours, maybe 3 hours, and you should you get okay. to use the rest of it for whatever you want. Okay. Is that an annual basis or is that over the course of whatever whatever grant you have to pay for? Oh, these are uh, such good questions. Oh, you're good, Adam. Okay. Um yeah, this is so we are funded through 2026, summer 2026. It is a one time hit mm -hmm. for each business, okay. like I said. Mm -hmm. But if there's a separate okay. LLC or some other some other entity or some line of business that you want to open, we can set we can support another one. Okay. Seeing these questions mean I need to be putting them into our materials <laughs> and sharing this information. Any other questions from people? I would take that as a note at this point. Take that as a note too. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Well, thank you, Nicole. Really appreciate all the time and, and all the information. Um, I know we mentioned it at the beginning of, of the class here, but there are other uh, classes you can um, access through both Nicole's program and my program. I put... Uh, we put some links in the comment box about where people can access the previous videos we've done with uh, Nicole and her program, as well as other uh, videos on other business topics. So feel free to check those out. Um, in the meantime, it might be the fastest way for you to get to those classes by using this YouTube link. Um, the other link, as I mentioned earlier, is um, a link to our website, and they're doing some updates to that. So I noticed those classes weren't coming up immediately, but that should be corrected soon. Um, just put in another plug for our AI um, uh, marketing class uh, tomorrow from 6 to 7.30. You can register uh, to attend in person uh, or virtually uh, the in-person uh, option. Um, the class will be taking place at the Doubletree Hotel in South Burlington, just across the street from Michaels and Staples, if you can picture where that is. 
And Nicole, is there any other class that you would like to put a plug in for? Yeah, I think we've got our last one on, did we do contracts already? Or do we have that one still coming up? Yeah, this is uh, our last planned one so This far. is our last one. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. Well, we might have to do more of these guys. I, I have, I don't really have a, many public webinars coming up. We have some other events, but there is, I'm going to be planning one. Uh, don't have a plan, don't have it scheduled yet, but I'm going to be planning one that our team's going to do on the new uh, Corporate Transparency Act and reporting requirements. So we'll be doing something on that. And then there's just, there's some other events that I'll let you guys know about and you can pass on. Um, we're basically listening for for what people want to hear about and we're trying to design some content that's responsive to that. So, so I'll just say, keep, I'll keep you posted. I'm sorry. Great. Thank you, Nicole. That's perfect. If there aren't any other um, questions from folks, again, just like to thank Nicole for sharing her time and expertise with us today. I know Sophia is going to be emailing everyone um, uh, a link to the recording and any other materials that were discussed um, in the introduction to today's class. So thank you everyone for attending. And if you would like to access our services at Micro Business, don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you everybody and take care. Have a good afternoon.